Lesson 5 Horizontal Atonement, the Cross, and the Church Sabbath Afternoon, July 22 God chose Israel to reveal His character to men. He desired them to be as wells of salvation in the world. To them were committed the oracles of heaven, the revelation of God's will. But the people of Israel lost sight of their high privileges as God's representatives. They forgot God and failed to fulfill their holy mission. The blessings they received brought no blessing to the world. All their advantages they appropriated for their own glorification. They shut themselves away from the world in order to escape temptation. The restrictions that God had placed upon their association with idolaters as a means of preventing them from conforming to the practices of the heathen, they used to build up a wall of separation between themselves and all other nations. They robbed God of the service He required of them, and they robbed their fellow men of religious guidance and a holy example. The Acts of the Apostles, page 14. Advancing in faith, Paul labored unceasingly for the upbuilding of God's kingdom among those who had been neglected by the teachers in Israel. Constantly he exalted Christ Jesus as the King of kings and Lord of lords, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, and exhorted the believers to be rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Colossians chapter 2, verse 7. To those who believe, Christ is a sure foundation. Upon this living stone, Jews and Gentiles alike may build. It is broad enough for all and strong enough to sustain the weight and burden of the whole world. This is a fact plainly recognized by Paul himself. In the closing days of his ministry, when addressing a group of Gentile believers who had remained steadfast in their love of the gospel truth, the apostle wrote, Ye are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. The Acts of the Apostles, page 175. I heard so many say that the different nationalities of Europe were peculiar and had to be reached in a certain way. But the wisdom of God is promised to those who feel their need and who ask for it. God can bring the people where they will receive the truth. Let the Lord take possession of the mind and mold it as the clay is molded in the hands of the potter, and these differences will not exist. I warn you, brethren and sisters, not to build up a wall of partition between different nationalities. On the contrary, seek to break it down wherever it exists. We should endeavor to bring all into the harmony that there is in Jesus, laboring for the one object, the salvation of our fellow men. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 181. Sunday, July 23, Brought Near in Christ In turning to the Gentiles in Antioch of Pisidia, Paul and Barnabas did not cease laboring for the Jews elsewhere wherever there was a favorable opportunity to gain a hearing. Later, in Thessalonica, in Corinth, in Ephesus, and in other important centers, Paul and his companions in labor preached the gospel to both Jews and Gentiles, but their chief energies were henceforth directed toward the building up of the kingdom of God in heathen territory, among peoples who had but little or no knowledge of the true God and of his Son. The hearts of Paul and his associate workers were drawn out in behalf of those who were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Through the untiring ministrations of the apostles to the Gentiles, the strangers and foreigners, who sometimes were far off, learned that they had been made nigh by the blood of Christ, and that through faith in his atoning sacrifice they might become fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12, 13, and 19. 
The Acts of the Apostles, pages 174 and 175. We are commanded to love one another as Christ has loved us. He has manifested His love by laying down His life to redeem us. The beloved disciple says that we should be willing to lay down our lives for the brethren. For everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Verse 1. If we love Christ, we shall love those who resemble him in life and character. And not only so, but we shall love those who have no hope and are without God in the world. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. It was to save sinners that Christ left his home in heaven and came to earth to suffer and to die. For this he toiled and agonized and prayed until heartbroken and deserted by those he came to save, he poured out his life on Calvary. The Sanctified Life, page 82. We must gather about the cross. Christ and Him crucified must be the theme of contemplation, of conversation, and of our most joyful emotion. We should have special praise services for the purpose of keeping fresh in our thoughts everything that we receive from God and of expressing our gratitude for His great love and our willingness to trust everything to the hand that was nailed to the cross for us. We should learn to talk the language of Canaan, to sing the songs of Zion. Lift Him Up, page 249. Monday, July 24. Reconciliation. God's Gift from the Cross. These Greek men came from the West to find the Savior at the close of his life, as the wise man had come from the East at the beginning. At the time of Christ's birth, the Jewish people were so engrossed with their own ambitious plans that they knew not of his advent. The Magi from a heathen land came to the manger with their gifts to worship the Savior. So these Greeks, representing the nations, tribes, and peoples of the world, came to see Jesus. So the people of all lands and all ages would be drawn by the Savior's cross. So shall many come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. The Desire of Ages, page 621. The cross is invested with a power that language cannot express. The work of the sons and daughters of God must be of a different character than has yet been manifested by a large number. If they love Jesus, they will have enlarged ideas of the love that has been expressed for fallen man, which required the provision of so expensive an offering to save the human race. Our Savior asks the cooperation of every son and daughter of Adam who has become a son or daughter of God. Our Savior declares that He brought from heaven as a donation eternal life. He was to be lifted up upon the cross of Calvary to draw all men unto Him. How then shall we treat the purchased inheritance of Christ? Tenderness, appreciation, kindness, sympathy, and love should be shown to them. Then we may work to help and bless one another. In this work we have more than human brotherhood. We have the exalted companionship of heavenly angels. They cooperate with us in the work of enlightening high and low. Sons and Daughters of God, page 229. John declares, Hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3-5 to One of Christ's last commands to his disciples was, Love one another as I have loved you. John chapter 13, verse 34 Do we obey this command, or are we indulging sharp, unchristlike traits of character? If we have in any way grieved or wounded others, 
it is our duty to confess our fault and seek for reconciliation. This is an essential preparation that we may come before God in faith to ask His blessing. Christ's Object Lessons, page 144. Tuesday, July 25. Breaking Down the Dividing Wall. In the days of Christ, selfishness and pride and prejudice had built strong and high the wall of partition between the appointed guardians of the sacred oracles and every other nation on the globe. But the Savior had come to change all this. The words which the people were hearing from his lips were unlike anything to which they had ever listened from priest or rabbi. Christ tears away the wall of partition, the self-love, the dividing prejudice of nationality, and teaches a love for all the human family. He lifts men from the narrow circle that their selfishness prescribes. He abolishes all territorial lines and artificial distinctions of society. He makes no difference between neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies. He teaches us to look upon every needy soul as our neighbor and the world as our field. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 42. The early church was made up of many classes of people of various nationalities. The hearts of those who had been converted under the labors of the apostles were softened and united by Christian love. Despite former prejudices, all were in harmony with one another. Satan knew that so long as this union continued to exist, he would be powerless to check the progress of gospel truth, and he sought to take advantage of former habits of thought in the hope that thereby he might be able to introduce into the church elements of disunion. Thus it came to pass that as disciples were multiplied, the enemy succeeded in arousing the suspicions of some who had formerly been in the habit of looking with jealousy on their brethren in the faith and of finding fault with their spiritual leaders, and so there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 87 and 88. However large may be a man's claim to knowledge and wisdom, unless he is under the teaching of the Holy Spirit, he is exceedingly ignorant of spiritual things. He needs to realize his danger and his inefficiency and to place entire dependence upon the one who alone is able to keep the souls committed to his trust, able to imbue them with his spirit, and to fill them with unselfish love for one another, thus enabling them to bear witness that God has sent His Son into the world to save sinners. Those who are truly converted will press together in Christian unity. Let there be no division in the Church of God, no unwise authority exercised over those who accept the truth. The meekness of Christ is to appear in all that is said and done. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 146. Wednesday, July 26. Jesus, Preacher of Peace. The peace spoken of by the great teacher is larger and fuller than we have imagined. Christ is ready to do large things for us, to restore our natures by making us partakers of His divine nature. He waits to link our hearts with His heart of infinite love in order that we may be fully reconciled to God. But it is our privilege to understand that God loves us as He loves His Son. When we believe in Christ as our personal Savior, the peace of Christ is ours. The reconciliation provided for us in the atonement of Christ is the foundation of our peace. But gloomy feelings are no evidence that the promises of God are of no effect. You look at your feelings, and because your outlook is not all brightness, you begin to draw more closely the garment of heaviness about your soul. You look within yourself and think that God is forsaking you. You are to look to Christ. In me, Christ says, ye shall have peace. 
Entering into communion with our Savior, we enter the region of peace. Lift Him Up, page 332. Christ is the Prince of Peace, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and it is His mission to restore to earth and heaven the peace that sin has broken. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Whoever consents to renounce sin and open his heart to the love of Christ becomes a partaker of this heavenly peace. There is no other ground of peace than this. The grace of Christ received into the heart subdues enmity. It allays strife and fills the soul with love. He who is at peace with God and his fellow men cannot be made miserable. Envy will not be in his heart. Evil surmisings will find no room there. Hatred cannot exist. The heart that is in harmony with God is a partaker of the peace of heaven and will diffuse its blessed influence on all around. The spirit of peace will rest like dew upon hearts weary and troubled with worldly strife. Christ's followers are sent to the world with the message of peace. Whoever, by the quiet, unconscious influence of a holy life, shall reveal the love of Christ, whoever by word or deed shall lead another to renounce sin and yield his heart to God, is a peacemaker. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, pages 27 and 28. Thursday, July 27. The Church, a Holy Temple The Jewish temple was built of hewn stones quarried out of the mountains, and every stone was fitted for its place in the temple, hewed, polished, and tested before it was brought to Jerusalem. And when all were brought to the ground, the building went together without the sound of axe or hammer. This building represents God's spiritual temple, which is composed of material gathered out of every nation and tongue and people of all grades, high and low, rich and poor, learned and unlearned. These are not dead substances to be fitted by hammer and chisel. They are living stones quarried out from the world by the truth, and the great master builder, the Lord of the temple, is now hewing and polishing them and fitting them for their respective places in the spiritual temple. When completed, this temple will be perfect in all its parts, the admiration of angels and of men, for its builder and maker is God. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 180. Upon the foundation that Christ himself had laid, the apostles built the church of God. In the scriptures, the figure of the erection of a temple is frequently used to illustrate the building of the church. Zechariah refers to Christ as the branch that should build the temple of the Lord. He speaks of the Gentiles as helping in the work. They that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord. And Isaiah declares, The sons of strangers shall build up thy walls. Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 15, and Isaiah chapter 60, verse 10. Writing of the building of this temple, Peter says, To whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, and precious, ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. The Acts of the Apostles, page 595. In the query of the Jewish and the Gentile world, the apostles labored, bringing out stones to lay upon the foundation. In his letter to the believers at Ephesus, Paul said, 
Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. And to the Corinthians he wrote, According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 10 to 13. The Acts of the Apostles, page 596. For further reading, That I May Know Him, How to Settle Your Troubles, page 181, and Our High Calling, All Honor to the Peacemakers, page 179.